3D modeling for the Rick Ice of Art today. So, yeah, thanks a lot for the, uh, for the invitation. <clears throat> so, today I'll basically talk about what we can learn from uh, modeling these heavy iron collisions in 3D, in particular uh, to the isobar system and like, the nuclear structures context. <clears throat> so, let me briefly start with an introduction. So, this period picture you have seen a few times. So we study, we try to study uh, the nuclear matter under extreme conditions by doing heavy ion collisions, we accelerate nuclear like, to near speed of light. Uh, however, those collision systems are tiny and also the dynamics that we want to probe are very fast on a time scale of 10 to the minus 23 seconds. So in this way, that uh, um, it's really challenging for the experiments uh, to actually probe what happens in this uh, interesting global plasma phase before all the particles just uh, freeze out and fly to the detectors. On the other side, we do have, can detect a variety of species of particles, uh, a variety of species of hadrons, pion and photons, and also other probes like Electromagnetic probes like photons and dilatons, and also uh, QCD jets in there. So, by combining all these different types of species, <coughs> particles, they carry different types of formations. And uh, we can say that uh, they carry so called multi messengers of the heavy ion collisions. So, the ultimate goal for the heavy ion collisions is trying to understand the properties of proton plasma or trying to find. Uh, the properties of, of the plasma. So what I like to understand is um, what uh, this uh, the equation of cinematic of these strongly coupled matters, how the energy density and pressure relate to each other, what's the speed of sound in this fluid, and also transport properties like shear and bond viscosities, diffusions, and also energy moment transport between the fluid and also hard jet uh, hard probes like jets. <clears throat> On the right hand side, I write a, a partial list of experimental observables uh, we can think about. In the ideal case, we would like to see that uh, it's like a one to one mapping. We measure some measurements and then they constrain certain aspects of the experiment uh, of the properties of photon plasma. But in reality, this is not the case. So it's always a very complex, complex mapping between the uh, property of photon plasma to the experimental observables. So in order to figure out how to universally map the, uh, the experimental data to those uh, quantities, it's basically require lots of computing. And uh, we'll say that uh, the amount of calculations we need to do is also a reach to exascale computings, and even with the help of the advanced statistical method of ratio analysis that we have, uh, that we have also discussed a few times in the meetings. So the package uh, that the numerical package I'm working on is called IED Music Framework. So it's a hybrid, a kind of multi-state framework. You can kind of block in this way. So in the initial state, we have uh, IP plasma. Uh, then you can connect to some uh, effective, uh, effective kinetic theory. Uh, these are in two dimension, uh, in boost, assuming boost invariance. In the three-dimensional case, we have this 3D global model that I will talk about in this talk. And this need to be combined with the so dynamic initializations where hydrodynamics doesn't happen at the fixed proper time, but the locally at different collision points that is needed for low energy conditions. With these initial conditions, we connect to a 3D hydrodynamic uh, simulation, which is called- In this community. package, in this repository, you don't have Trento? We don't have Trento, yeah. So okay. Trento is harder to use, so I didn't connect to Trento. Okay. Because the scaling, you can already just take it from the global model. You can just read off the thickness function and then do the whatever Trento has to do. And also, there's it's a- not nicely integrated in your- issues, issues, There's also a parallel effort from JSK, which, which I already had Trento, so I don't bother to <laughs> do another one to do it in a complete fashion. If you want to run Trento with music, you can just run this. Yeah, but I don't want to use all of your nice scripts. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that, that is a little bit more. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so once you have the uh, hydrodynamics. So can, can I yeah. naively understand the 3D Glauber? It's like the, the previous Glauber, which didn't give a description of the 3D Glauber. 
Well, the, that's just the end loss, right? In the global model, you just have the geometry from the nucleus, and then you need to have a protein for the end loss, how you map the whole sickness function into the energy density. So that initially the global has these two component fixed, like K plus D and the K times D component. And that found out to be disfavored by the patient as this way, much more kind of closer to this TA times D to some power. Square root of two yeah, like your 3D Glauber doesn't doesn't reduce exactly to one of those previous 2D no, it's, right? it's, it's, it's a different it's, thing. Yeah. So so in the you will see in the in the future how we can I want to play make some comparison to the estimates. So yeah, so so once you solve the hydrodynamics together with the equation of state provided by the lattice PCD, then you can actually convert fluid into particles, and then at the same stage, you can also compute the so called polarizations of the of particles, and then you can put it into a transport, and then do spectral analysis and flow analysis, complete experiments. So, all of these are open source and can be done from the website. <coughs> so, um, so, the nutshell of these uh, multi stage uh, simulations, what you want to uh, kind of uh, remember is that uh, we basically evolve uh, through different stages, which are governed by different length scale of the physics. For example, uh, the three distinct stages we can write out as a, at the very early time, we have initial collision plus some pre equilibrium stage, which drive the system towards to microscopic equilibrium, local equilibrium. And then we can use the hydrodynamics to evolve afterward. And then at the later stage, we, try to, we convert fluid into particles, and then we simulate the reactions of the particles in the dilute hydraulic phase. So in the whole of uh, these uh, simulations, we ensure that the engine when the cancer of the system is continuous. So these uh, uh, impose two matching uh, procedures at these two uh, uh, stage. At the early time, if we want to match the uh, pre equilibrium uh, engine bond tensor to hydro, we basically do some uh, lambda matching. And then, uh, and then uh, when we also at that point impose the uh, equation of state from lattice. So, this is where uh, things become uh, uh, there's a sudden transition usually because the pre equilibrium dynamics usually is uh, described by conformal dynamics. So, you don't have a trace, uh, trace is zero for T and U. And then if you match to a hydrodynamics uh, with a realistic equation of state, and you calculate the pressure and the energy density, you will get uh, uh, some non-zero trace. So and this is usually compensated by some initial bulk viscosity, which sometimes is artificial. So Jim, what's involved in the lambda matching with the So lambda matching just assuming that your T menu is an eigenvalue problem. So it's kind of you're solving an equation, say T menu. Times of flow velocity u is equal to e times u. So, so basically, these define your flow velocities uh, from a given energy moment and answer. It follows that the direction of the energy current of the fluid, and then define also define your local energy density. Okay. So, just a definition you can decompose yeah. the 10 components of TMU, uh, you know, you know in terms of other, other quantities. It's, right. it's the one to one correspondence between the two, just a Different way of describing yeah. those components. So okay. Usually, the hydrodynamic equation is also formulated in this frame so that you don't have any heat current. Otherwise, if you do a different definition of flow velocities, but follow the kinds of charged particles, then you will have a heat kind of heat diffusion in your systems. And you also sort of solve that as well. At, at lower energies or large heat, the carrying densities, people would use the Eckert frame. Mm -hmm. to get rid yeah, of like yeah. diffusion current. So like in astrophysics, they always yeah. use Eckert frame, yeah. which makes like making one to one comparisons. Yeah, I don't know what Eckert frame. Eckert frame is <laughs> essentially what you do yeah. this. It's exception. a more general discussion. So you have yeah. to, yeah. so you, you usually formulate hydrodynamics as an expansion around some equilibrium system. Yeah. Yeah. If you're out of equilibrium, then there's some arbitrariness in like choosing which equilibrium state am I expanding around to describe this non-equilibrium system. Mm -hmm. okay. And these are all kind of like choices yeah. in that. So, so, so yeah, these are two basic like what you say I follow the energy direction for my fluid, and the other say my fluid follow my particle densities. Okay. So the then particle density and, and energy can flow in different directions, right? So that leads to diffusions. Uh, but uh, these are the two popular frames you can choose. Okay. But not as you can even choose a general frame. Where was it? No, no, these two, and uh, can you formulate first order hydro to be stable with a uh, general frame? Yeah. 
Okay. And these two are not stable. Yeah, the two common ones are the rest frame means yeah. there's no energy flow, yeah. the momentum density is zero. And the Eckert frame is where you choose that there's no, uh, no, no, no current of uh, whatever your conserved quantity is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah so that's the early stage. At the later stage, when we convert particle fluid cells into particles, this is usually then through so called Google for particleizations, where you also match the uh, continuing new tensor, uh, make sure that uh, your resonance gas uh, continuing tensor reconstruct on the hydrolysis gas to reproduce the fluid dynamic continuing tensor. Okay, so uh, you have uh, already uh, here a lot of talks about Bogle plasma. So it is the hottest, the smallest, and the almost perfect fluid in nature, and you can create in the, this laboratory. And also, uh, from the uh, knowledge of that is QCD, we know that uh, this, uh, at the high temperature phase, the degrees of freedom increase rapidly above 150 mV and is quite close to the uh, degrees of freedom of free uh, quantum muon gas. So, so uh, the, the main topic of, the, of our field is driven to actually try to understand now in a quantitative way, how does this strongly coupled uh, liquid properties emerge from the fundamental interaction of QCDs? So there are three main directions that people working on, both from theory and experimental side. So one is uh, that we want to probe the quantum plasma with different length scales probes, such as jets and heavy quarks, where their energy or mass can actually treat as a different length scale to, to, to interact with the problem class on a different strength. And you can also uh, do the exercise uh, trying to study how the collective behavior involved with us as a function of system size. And this is related to which is the smallest problem class of droplets that we can create in experiments. And we can also looking at collision with different energies, which is related to the scan of the problem of QCD phase diagram in the final finite chemical potential energy. What I want to emphasize is in order to achieve all these three uh, directions, uh, three plus one dissimulation essential, namely that uh, if you want to look at the response from the jets, this is a three dimensional object, no, no perseverance. And for the small systems, you usually see that it's asymmetric collisions. And in these asymmetric collisions, the rapidity dynamics become important, and that's why you need three D simulations. And also we go to low energies, which I will discuss mainly in this talk. We will also see that three D simulations become essential. So, so, so mainly I'll focus on this talk on the low energy and, and also energy scan. So the reason for rich energy scan is that uh, you can actually uh, dial down the collision energies and explore not just the temperature axis of the property of global plasma and it may be equal to zero, but uh, a finite, uh, uh, the, the quantum plasma in a finite chemical potential regions. So if you look at, say, a collision energy of 19.6 GeV or 5 GeV, the cartoon shows you that uh, the fireball generated uh, in these uh, collisions around the middle rapidity can actually, uh, looking at a phase diagram with a chemical potential around uh, 200 to 400 MeV. So this gives us opportunity to not just uh, uh, kind of uh, identify the property of problem plasma as a function of temperature, but also multi dimensions as a function of chemical potentials. Here, once we are not only looking at thinking about temperature chemical potentials, but also strenuous and also uh, electric charge on the nicer scales. You want this or not? So, we want to. And they said the main goal of doing this energy uh, being a scan program is trying to find a possible predictions of a critical point on the first order phase transitions along these critical, along these QCD phase diagrams between uh, the hadron and the KGP uh, transitions at a finite chemical potentials. And in the meantime, we also look at how the transport property changes as well as how the charge diffuse uh, uh, process moves. And also, when you do these uh, collisions, you naturally extend and building some bridges with the lower or intermediate heavy ion collisions that are done in the laboratory, like similar to neutron star mergers and also F3 in physics. Although they may not reach that high temperature, but the really dense regions may be still 
yeah. have some connection. <clears throat> I've got a question. So, so you you wanted two hundred GV nineteen point six and five GV. That's a range of forty, right? Mm -hmm. But the temperature is only changes a little bit. It, 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 yeah. It, how do I understand why the temperature probe is is not changing so much with the, the energy of the heat? Well, so this is mainly because that in the higher high energies, most of the energies are just hard to assume. Okay. You just have very energy that going in the heat. The level of energy in the middle period is not that much compared to like uh, 5 GeV, where that uh, you don't have much of the transparency of the going there. Yeah, Most yeah. of the uh, energy work is kind of in the middle period. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's yeah. really not possible to reach even higher than temperature then? You can reach high. This is kind of just a cartoon blobs where most of the stuff going through. Yeah. The highest temperature you can reach can be reached like this 500 MeV or something like that, CMV. At the very early time, but it's kind of a very small fraction of the thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's hard to reach high temperatures and high density. That's the main issue. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, if you want to simulate those uh, uh, energy, those collisions and low energies, one of the things that uh, we need to face is just basically uh, from kinematics. So, so if you look at the heavy collision in the left frame. And 20 GeV due to Lorentz contraction, the two nuclei are highly contracted like along the longitudinal directions. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and we can see that uh, this is a link scale one Fermi, and this is much narrower than one Fermi. So you can really think about these uh, two pancakes along the V direction. So, so all the nuclei are projected into a two dimensional, uh, two, two -dimensional <coughs> direction and in the XY directions. However, if you go down to like say 20 GeV, then you can see that you start to see the longitudinal structures of the heavy collisions as they come in. So they are not like the two exact uh, same sheet anymore. So you start to worry about uh, the final extensions of these nuclear along the Z direction. So if you calculate this overlapping time for the two nuclear to complete pass through each other, uh, this you can just calculate this pocket formula. <clears throat> and you can see that at the lower S energy of 7.7 .7 GeV in the correct amount of star measure, the overlapping time is composed to about three Fermi, which means that roughly relatively the thickness of the nucleus is about three Fermi in there. And the total lifetime of the heavy ion collision is about 10 Fermi. So this is already like one third of the really interesting dynamics already start to happen. So this uh, lets you wonder that this is actually a state that you really need to also model uh, in the low energy when you, <coughs> when you go to low energy. It's the Z directions uh, dynamics it could lead to some different interesting things in there compared to high energy. So on the right hand side, I just list a partial list of the model that people come up in the recent few years, uh, trying to extend the two plus one D uh, Simulations into a 3D simulations uh, as you go down to lower energies. So, we are doing mostly this 3D and Z model. So, this is what I'm going to talk, talk about. <clears throat> and uh, what we, our starting point is just the global geometry, which essentially you already uh, discussed many times. You have a two dimensional plane and you project all the nucleons into uh, in all the nucleus onto the two, uh, to the, uh, <clears throat> two dimensional plane and determine so-called collision geometry. And then uh, for each collisions, now in addition to these two dimensional collisions, we actually consider about how they evolve along the longitudinal direction. This is how the cartoon looks like here. So we have two nuclei and incoming nucleons. So we go first go to their pair rest frame. And then we basically uh, simulate their collisions along the longitudinal directions in one dimension, it's longitudinal directions. And, and then after the collision, we assume that there's an energy loss of these collisions. So, so the, the, the active kind of component we can use inside the nucleon are basically a kind of three valence block and plus some rest leftover energy more the current, which will treat another hotspot. So you have basically about four hot spots that you can use like four part house. Uh, you can use inside the nucleus. And then we we'll basically randomly pick one and then do the collisions when, when the when two neutron collide. After the collisions, we basically assume that those two hot spots 
are decelerated along the longitudinal directions, assuming it's a very classical string kind of intentions. And then, then you can actually populate the energies lost in these collisions as a flux too, along the longitudinal directions, as the as the two drivers are those are power. And then we also deposit uh, the, the final state energies of these two patterns at the end of the strings as two gauges. So these determine the longitudinal profile of our, our models, in addition to the conventional global uh, geometries we have in the transverse. So in this case, we can also identify where baryon charges is. So we can use our standard baryon densities, the net baryon density, to carry by the two nucleons at the end of the strings. Or we can also uh, assume that the, the variance are not carried by the string or by the, by the charge uh, quark, but also by the uh, junction of the string, so they can actually fluctuate into the other pairs. So this is a model for the proposed by Dima a few of years ago. Okay. So how does this uh, change with time? So this energy density in the string is doesn't matter like when it should. Yeah, so this is just the initial time, like up, right after the collision. And then, then, then you will have some kind of deceleration dynamics happen to actually make it a finite in, in this in, in kind of space uh, time. And then you just deploy into a high point. And the energy density you get doesn't depend on how long it takes. Well, it, it, it depends on how long the string is. It depends basically if you just collide, it will just be some kind of deceleration. So we assume there's a fixed number of time, fixed amount of time before it deploys the height. So you that determines the length total Ah, that's right. So the density is not fixed. Yeah. So it's, it's the total energy that's fixed. Yeah, it's the total energy under underneath the area is basically whatever okay. loss is. Yes. Yeah. So so if you get lost on these uh, these descriptions, just remember one sentence. In these models, we just try to make sure that the incoming energy. Momentum and net ground densities from the initial nuclear collision stage is conserved on map to higher dimensions. And then we just model how the, the thing distributes along the longitudinal directions as parameters. So, what you can learn from this uh, kind of simple kinematic uh, uh, models is that uh, at high energies, you can look at where does the stream produce. And understand how uh, this uh, uh, look like uh, in there. So, at the high energy for the Maturin GV, we know that the two nuclei contract with two very thin sheets of pancake along the Z directions. And you can see after the collisions, all the strings are kind of uh, populate in a uh, surface in a parabola with constant tau. Tau is basically t squared minus z squared. And you can see this, uh, this uh, all the string is almost nicely aligned in this uh, a constant parabola uh, in there. So if you're a hydro expert, you live in Taueda coordinates, which is uh, not usual, but you can do a coordinate transformations to compute the, the longitudinal proper time and also the space time rapidity. And if you plot the string distributions in this space, you can see that this look like the, the plot on the right hand side. So let's focus, focus, focus on the mid, uh, mid space time rapidity around eta is equal to zero. And you can see all the string, also that we have a plateau regions around 20 GV where this is flat. And this is actually where usually we call the Alkin uh, longitudinal boost environment, where everything happens at the basic uh, fixed proper time. And then that's usually the two plus one the hydrodynamic start to simulate. You just assume all the source are deposited at a fixed proper time and it evolve as a function of proper time in the simulations. By the way, now you can already see that if you go to the finite space time rapidity, this is already not the case. And this is actually can be understood as this bit right there. So at the full rapidity, you're actually going along with one nuclear. So the Lorentz contractions of one of the projectile is actually reduced. If you kind of going in a trajectory along this uh, straight line of eta s equal to constant. So in this case, you have basically a thin sheet of nuclei kind of sweep through the other guys. But this actually has finite time because uh, the projectile has a finite width along these directions. And that is the consequence you can see that there's a spread 
of the strings at the four periods. So this would be like fixed target experiment. Right? Yeah, this is like fixed target. <laughs> you can think about also this is like fixed target experiment. So, so, so this means that even at the high energies, if we go to forward enough in the periods, there's also uh, this type of geometry is happening. And you also need to take into account that not all the uh, nuclei are accepted, excited or collided at the same time, the same property. Only in the infinite energy limit where everything will just the constant time. And that's what boost variance is. If we go down to low energies, uh, even uh, you can see that in the tau, in the TZ Lycon, you can see that uh, uh, because the two nuclei has a finite time to pass through each other, all the collisions happen at different time. And you will see there's a finite spread of the uh, energy density produced in this in this TZ coordinates. So in order to deal with this, we need to develop a scheme called dynamic initialization scheme, which deal with this finite interaction. So basically you have a source term that could happen in this, uh, in this uh, kind of blue, green shaded regions. Um, so you want to treat all these individual strings as a source terms uh, as, as the hydrodynamic start, as, as the hydrodynamic starts from T equal to zero. So you will start with some kind of vacuum or with T mu equal to zero but just gradually feeding source terms uh, as the field start to simulate. And this has been adapted by multiple fields uh, over the world uh, to do some type of simulations. So here's one of the examples. So for example, if you want to simulate the one of the HDI collision, global collision 19.6G, we have two new plaques coming in. And then after that, you will see this is the Kind of the time revolutions at the only time you will have a heat up stage where the things to start to deploy energies and then once the nuclear pass through each other you just see the three-dimensional expansion of the field so that's basically the only you see the first snapshot of the of the type of slides okay so so that, that's basically the compli complications you introduce when you want to simulate 3d simulations however we still want to draw some connections with the two dimensional pictures we have uh, for, from the high energy limit, right? Because that actually gives us the picture of geometry and also give us connections with nuclear structures. And uh, we want to see that, uh, although the real case in the three simulation is more complicated, but uh, uh, this, uh, this geometry picture still is very helpful. And also, we'll see the quantitative calculations in afterward. Uh, the geometry facts uh, from nuclear structure still remain, even though you're folding these complications of the 3D model. So here is basically a snapshot of uh, density, uh, energy density contour uh, at the early time uh, from the uh, 3D uh, initial conditions. So uh, on the left plot is uh, in the corners kind of X and eta X. Eta X is the longitudinal space time rapidity. You can think about these longitudinal directions. We can see that uh, the energy density looks like a flux too. That's basically the building from the collisions. And then you can see there's a projectile going from the left to the right, indicated as the yellow one, and the target going from the right to the left as the purple one downstairs. And there's some finite impact parameter. So uh, you know this picture a little bit better uh, from, from the discussions over the workshop. So in the transverse plane, in the X and Y directions, if uh, for example, now look at eta S equal to zero, just cut this guy through and look at the shape. I see this uh, overlapping area uh, from the two nuclei and I see more, more, a lot of energy deposits in this overlapping area. So, so, so this is like a conventional global model, which you'll see from the two dimensional mm -hmm. version and uh, from our model, we just have uh, a longitudinal extension of that with these, uh, uh, with these dynamics. So we can go one step further, try to ask how does the shape look like in this 3D model compared to the conventional 2D model. So here is the calculation of the eccentricity. So epsilon two is a function of centrality, <clears throat> epsilon three is a function of centrality. 
uh, from this model. So the 3D calculations go from the black dots, and the lines are the estimate from the nucleus of the functions. Are, are you doing this with the energy density or the entropy density? So all of them are energy density. Okay. Yeah. Because normally the square root of T, TP is with the entropy. Yeah. So so what you will see is that um, at least first of all, <laughs> none of the <laughs> estimate from 2D uh, give you a very close result. So the epsilon two is somewhat between the the summation of T plus T B and the group of uh, like what all these different choice. So for two D basically what you have is basically the nuclear six function T and T B. You can construct multiple of them. So the conventional global will be equal to T A plus T B. You can have T A multiplied by T B and also different power. So, so you, you, as Jackie comments, so usually you can assume that the entropy is proportional to square root of TATB that's preferred by the transitive tuning, and that's close to the TATB to two thirds. Mm -hmm. right? Energy density will have the fourth yeah. quarter three power, and that's close to that power. As you can see, that's not too much different if you use the product, all of them are quite close to each other. We get the V3 has some difference in the. So this seems to imply that uh, the energy density and mid rapidity can't be reproduced by any, like at least common tuning of well, the Well, yeah, yeah. So, so in our model, we don't have a very direct control on what kind of scaling you want. Yeah, exactly. So I, I was curious, yeah. would, would you go farther and say that you can't write the energy density that you get in your model of mid rapidity as a function of TA and TB in not, general? Not in this simple form, maybe some other form. Could maybe be. some other function would work? Yeah. So what about uh, LHC energies? Like, do, do there won't be something like this. These are two energy units, so these are not taking into account the energies. So mm -hmm. I already go to pretty close to two energies. So, and then another question: In your actual uh, model, are you adding them? You, it's like a real Glauber model, so you're adding KTB when you. No, so so we don't have a TV TV concept anymore. Okay. Right? We just do individual nuclear collisions. I see. Okay. And then model how they lose energies. Oh, okay. And then that's come out from. The, so, so we can do a slightly different comparisons. So here, so this is the ratio of V2 to V3, epsilon to epsilon 3, because if we think about viscosity, well, bring down both of them. So maybe we can actually compare the ratios. And also on the right-hand side is the Pearson correlation. So we can actually correlate the initial epsilon 3, epsilon n from 3D with the 2D estimator, and then even by that. Right? So you can see that uh, on the left hand side, uh, it is kind of the red line with TA times TB give you roughly okay ratios. But most of both the V2 and epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 are bigger, I think, for the TA times TB than all. Can you already use Yeah, we'll watch that. Uh, so, so, so at least for go go, we, we, we can reproduce each of these now. Okay? So for 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 example, in the left hand side figure, you can already just draw the data of each which which we deliver in three to up to maybe. Seven. But yeah, but the conversion factor is different, and the viscosity mm -hmm. may have a different. Mm -hmm. you, you, so yeah, yeah. More you can do a you can do a reasonable estimate by taking I forget the the power, but you take you take epsilon two to a, a slightly non unitary no. unit power. Okay. And it, it, it approximately cancels out sort of yeah, that could be some other way to get a better. So if you want to do if you want a shortcut, although yeah. you actually calculate the end, so I guess yeah. you don't need you don't need the shortcut. Yeah, yeah. This is just try to draw the connection with with 2D model. So this, yeah. Sorry, this yeah. is interesting because I I think showing on the right hand side that yeah. when you look at the vectors, it looks like it's much more correlated. Whereas yeah. on the left, you're doing yeah. the magnitude. Right, right. So it's yeah. the, the rooming square by itself doesn't really Connect, but if you look at even by event wise, the Pearson correlate slightly favor this green and uh, square root mm -hmm. functions, but not that much. It's all very close to each other. But why you can't read epsilon 2 2 not the epsilon 2? I can cover that. I can cover that. Yeah, because then you the mean I can also cover that. Right hand side, you don't have Yeah, I can try that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the right hand side has fluctuations. Yeah, you're putting yeah. it's a mean over a bunch of events. So. Yeah. Yeah, but did you do the correlate? Uh, where's the blue line? Hmm? On the right. on where's the blue line on the right? What is? What where is, is it? It kind of kind of gets lost. Oh, can you can you follow it? So what, what do you mean? The blue line I can see on the very oh, right, line. but where does it go? Oh, I think it's underneath the red. Okay, so, so it's worse than the green. It's worse than the green. 
Well, by a little bit. Even though on the previous slide that was yeah. that was sort of the best one. Right, right. Okay. So 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 even by event, you see that the, the 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 correlation is better between these two square root and two sides. These two actually being the highest case in front of And the, the, the TA times TV and TA plus TV give you a little bit less, but not much. But this is a little big, right? A equals to zero. So we can just say that an I A equals four. So a very four period. So one thing you can immediately notice is that the, the line doesn't change. The line just shows 2D, only the point changes. The 3D point, you can see that the epsilon to increase it. Because below, before, we are below the, we are kind of in between the line here at the middle period. If we go to forward, because the epsilon matter will increase, increase in here above the line. <clears throat> These three that almost don't change when you go to forward. But in this case, we can actually clearly see a winner of the, of the mapping. So it actually go back to TA theory. So if we go to forward, it mostly the, the, the shape of the energy density close to the shape of the projectile. <laughs> and also we look at that, uh, the same thing happened if you look at backward at minus four, it the clo is close correlated to the to target. So this model gives you that in the middle somewhat mixture of T and TB, but at the four and backward going, it kind of follow the incoming projectile in the same time. That's basically how the shape looks like in these two dimensions. So, can we think of this as like what we have here is almost like an average thing over rapidity? Because it seems like if you go to four to back of rapidity, you're kind of above, and if you go to mid rapidity, you're kind of below, and then mm -hmm. maybe it's capturing that kind of average behavior. Well, I mean, in the, in the two, if you have yeah, the two D one is more captured the average rapidity. Yeah, it, could, it, could be, it, yeah. it seems yeah. like. Yeah. If you were to average over that, yeah, or I, think, I, think, I think it's more like a three component. Like, if you can think about there's yeah, something in the rapidity kind of interact, and then there are some kind of reminiscent on the on the on the four rapidity going together with the project. Yeah. So, so yeah, okay. I'm confused about with the four rapidity correlates with TA, backwards rapidity correlates with TB. Yeah. But to me, if it's just linear in one of them and doesn't have the factor of the other, it doesn't seem like a collision. No, it, it's correct. It's just saying basically uh, it's the, the TA is already the participants. So it's already only in this, uh, in this region. I don't, I exclude or really exclude the, the, uh, the spectrum. Okay. All right. So, so, so you need to have the collision. So basically, we need to have the nuclear inside the say the yellow block to collide and wound it, and their shape actually is seen in the four pin. Okay. And the middle pin is somewhat mixture of both both of them. Yeah. Usually, just argue that uh, whenever mm -hmm. there's a wounded nuclear in the projectile, uh, their shape is easier to see if you go to four pin. Okay. Because they actually just follow us through <laughs> most of the energy to pull it. Could collision like a problem uh, with scope be useful if you have to use for scope? Yeah, so I think that's a great yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you do asymmetric one, you could be able to see. Okay, so, so I talked about that there's a modeling of energy loss in these collisions. So this is actually dialed as a function parameters. So what in our model of parameterized energy loss for each pair of the nuclei. And then we, we know the incoming energies for these <coughs> incoming nuclear pairs. We basically parameterize how they lost their rapidities after the collisions. So this is done with three parameters. We basically say, okay, at the fix two, four and the six, how much they lost, and then just use a piecewise line in there. And we also introduce some fluctuations uh, around the mean, but this it needs to be bounded by the fact that the, the y loss at most can go to the initial one, so it cannot lose much uh, more rapidities than the initial coming one. So this is already bounded. So that's why you can see the band shrinks at the early time because the mean is already close to the bound. <laughs> But uh, on the other side, if you, on the free space, you are basically have a Gaussian fluctuation. With some widths, there's also a few parameters. So we can fit this rapidity loss functions to heavy ion collisions. So you can just adjust these points and then you fit the PA and also AA uh, in central. So this is just a 
a small part of the fitting. So you can see that we do reasonable job for proton loads in central for the asymmetric systems and also symmetric for the systems in there. So both these two systems may determine these points around the unit of six, the being radius of 20 GB. The lower point is a kind of tuned to the lower edges. But here is basically uh, what you can uh, look at at the different energies. So just in data at 20 GB, as a function of different centrality from zero to five, zero to six, or these real centrality for the four volts. Um, so you can look at the 20 GB and that the most of the thing you can see that this really is doing a good job. And then we can actually go further to look at uh, uh, some dimensional observables that we study in 2D. For example, in MPT, that you can see that from this model, initially, if you don't have bulk viscosity, you get this dash line, <coughs> which is a slightly overestimated in MPT. So you need to increase, improve a non zero bulk viscosity. So this is the current tune we have <coughs> on the bulk viscosity. We have some peak structure as a function of temperature, peak around 170 MeV. <coughs> and then we need to actually extend this some mu dependence in the, in the finite chemical potential regions so that we can match the lower energy ones for the like 26 GB cycle. So this is basically a hand tuning kind of shape of this uh, function we use right now. Uh, the more seriously you need to uh, import this into a patient analysis to get more of a construct. But right now, just some hand tuning to basically schedule that this actually <coughs> helps in terms of simulations. And similarly, you can do <coughs> tuning for the shear viscosities. One thing we find is significantly that you need to increase the shear viscosity at the finite chemical potential regions. So here, as a simple case, we just use a factor constant at the at a function of temperature. And this is mainly kind of you can fit to the 200 GeV data. So D23. So if you want to use the same viscosity, so it doesn't change, it's flat. They will overestimate the 19.6. So you need to increase uh, the chemical uh, the value of shear viscosity at the finite chemical potential because 19.6 is around like chemical potential around 200 GeV. So you are mostly sensitive to the regions around UV equal to 200 levels. What is the value for, for this low UV? 0.2? Uh, oh, you mean at the, the, at the very zero, at zero? UV? Yeah, because I, should, I try to see the number. The I number. think it's around 0.08. 0. 0. 0. Yeah. So. It doesn't change so much. Or yeah, like, it changes a little bit. I think up to like 0. 0.16 or something. Mm -hmm. Roughly a factor of two. If we go to point six, <laughs> uh, this part is is just yeah, is, 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 is. okay. So that's basically the the transport part. So with this three D model, we can verify a few things that uh, usually is taken into granted from the boosting nervous simulations. First is basically the centrality uh, kind of dependence or central definitions. So usually in the two D simulations, we use the particle multiplicity at the middle affinity to determine centralities. However, in the experiments, usually they use a four detector somewhere. I think this is star cut, some of the star detector cut in 1.73.7, and this is the V0A from Alice. So they use this four detector to determine centrality to avoid self correlations uh, in terms of measurements. As you can see for these uh, heavy ion collisions, lead or gold gold. The correlation between the forward particle multiplicity and the central multiplicity are tightly correlated, at least in our model. So this helps us to verify that okay, the central dependence is actually quite okay. That even if you do a boosting <coughs> simulations, selecting events from mid rapidity, you're actually doing a good job um, to estimate the, the centrality in the forward period as well. <coughs> I think also this can be actually. Deep all the verified experimentally. But this is not the case. Uh, if you go to asymmetric collision like you don't know, you can see the scatter is much more kind of around this one. And uh, if you do uh, an event selection in this uh, in this range, I think this is a Phoenix <coughs> measurement, Phoenix acceptance. 
and uh, and you really need to trigger on the forward and, and, and select that. Otherwise, if you just select from minimum for middle period, you're cutting vertical line on these uh, inner examples, and you clearly see that this is much different from you cutting uh, you know horizontal directions. I think the rapidity is the gold going side or the proton going. These are the gold going side. Okay. Yeah. So, so the rest of the talk I will focus on is this uh, so called the longitudinal flow correlations. So, this is uh, how you want to look at the flow and the subject flow vectors uh, in different rapidity frames, in different rapidity ranges. So, this actually is measured in experiments uh, using this so called Rn uh, variable. It is defined by this ratio. And uh, in the both numerator and denominator, these are two particle correlations. You correlate one particles in one of the uh, detector in the middle rapidity with a reference uh, uh, detector in the forward periods. And, uh, and you, you make these ratios and this uh, reference QM vector uh, effects sort of cancel. And uh, the deviation from one of these ratios will tell you the, the decorrelation between QN at minus eta and QN plus eta. So that's why uh, this gives you the relative uh, kind of angles uh, between these two 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 Q vectors with respect to one reference. So the cartoon is showing that if you have some kind of twisted fireball at a four rapidity, that the, the flow angle is going this direction and the backward direction in other directions, then you will see there's a, a, a difference, a deviation of I away from one using this measure. And the reason you have this reference uh, uh, detector away from this uh, measurement is basically you want to have a large enough eta gap so that you, you suppress uh, other two body correlation resonance decay or one flow, so that your, your measurement is only <coughs> from the flow correlations. And also, uh, from the theoretical calculations, you can also do the similar estimator of I as a function of the initial geometry. So if you see there's a flat, uh, we, we have a 3D initial conditions, you can actually calculate the shape in every slicing data. And if the shape changes, you can also build up this correlation. So this will be an estimator from the initial state that you can calculate from the model. So first we want to see basically whether the estimator is good or not. So here is a calculation, the black is the the full calculation with hydrodynamics and measured R2 with the Q vectors from the final state, which is exactly the same as experiments. And then you can compare with the uh, initial stage, epsilon 2 uh, uh, correlator. So you can see that uh, they are actually uh, quite different. So this means that uh, the, the value is that you cannot very easily use the initial state estimator to estimate the final results. You really need to do the expensive calculation to compute RN uh, to the final state and, and compare with there. <clears throat> so we can uh, also look at the, the effects of viscosities on there. So here I only run the one with and without bulk viscosity. And it clearly you can see there's a not much difference, at least in the global collisions, when you turn on bulk viscosity or not. And this is mainly just an effect. Uh, so this uh, uh, RN is mainly effects of uh, maybe shear viscosity and also the initial charge. And they will detect the full PPP correlation. They will let you know by some matter. We only can only get the same people with some percent. Yeah. So now we can. Why do you say shear is important? Maybe, I don't know. I haven't tested it. Okay. So I mean, yeah. I only, I only have this. In the past, we found it's pretty, pretty weak dependence. Mm -hmm. Even on shear. Sure. Just. Oh, no, sorry, I'm sorry, that was an easy one. Sorry, go ahead. Now we can come up with data. So, first is we look at the global collision at two different energy 227. So, here is R2 for two centrality beams. Left is 10 to 40, right is 40 to 80. So, uh, you can see that the global collision at 200 GV is quite well compared to data. While if we go use the same parameter and go down to 27, we add full estimates of the correlation a little bit, at least in this current model. So we're still trying to figure out whether we can improve 
827, uh, and we'll see whether uh, we can get a slightly better age dependence. On that. But right now, we some seem that the model overpredict the, <coughs> the decorrelations as you put them together. <coughs> But not by, not by too much. So we can also at the same time look at R three. So R three is a little bit more statistical category. So you see the lines still jagged a little bit. So but you can see that that R three case uh, different from R two. <coughs> actually, the energy dependence is so for introduced between two hundred and uh, twenty seven G times one for the two central points. <coughs> And in the other case, we can also now uh, start to go to isobar. And uh, first is that uh, from the GOGO and the isobar, we have a system size difference between two uh, collision uh, systems. So, so we can actually compare uh, both of them together to actually understand the system size dependence of these correlations. So, so you can see the, the black is again the GOAT measurements. And the red is the uh, isobar. So for the Rosinia, we also get slightly larger uh, decorrelations compared to the to the experiments uh, as we use the same cuts as star. So star use a different, slightly different cuts for the measurements. Uh, I think this is uh, mainly trying to uh, suppress the flow in the Rosinia case. Um, so I haven't studied whether uh, the difference is coming from different cuts or not. I think not, but still, uh, there could be also some other check. But if you even go further, let's say you have a larger separation of those two particle correlations, you can even suppress the correlation effect because that will be a separation if the data is actually large enough. Uh, why haven't you? <laughs> because in one case, you compare them, let's say, if you look at two sides within the middle, which is a correlated forward. Yeah. But here you have a short, relatively shorter range. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not just long flow, relatively shorter range of the decoration, the other is long yeah. range. Mm -hmm. But then if you push this reference to no, extremely forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, the difference yeah. is the yeah. 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 difference. Yeah. Sure. I'm really confused about why star did different data ranges. So. Yeah, they told me that the uh, uh, data range is because uh, the Rosinia has some long flow if you do it the same time. <clears throat> They have a 2.1 to 5.1 detector. They say that if you use a 2.1 cut, you still see some workflow in the measurements. So you increase the range. Mm -hmm. Initially, I thought that was a typo in the slides. But I confirmed that it is 2.1 to 5.1. So that's why we have a so you can also again look at R three. R three is also uh, some, the model has a slightly less uh, kind of decorrelations in R three compared to uh, the R two case, but uh, you don't mm -hmm. see too much difference uh, between the system size. In the mm -hmm. So here is the interesting one that uh, I look at the Rosinia uh, versus Aconia. So so in here I trigger on ultra central collisions zero to one percent. So we are the two nuclei fully overlap. So you can also, uh, so, so in terms of the uh, nuclear structure deformations for the Rosinia, uh, you use a non-zero beta two. And the Sarconia, you have include a uh, non-zero beta three equal to 0.2. <coughs> so what you find is that uh, actually, uh, the, the first is R2 is actually uh, opposite to the expectations. So we first would expect that if you have a bigger beta two, you should get a smaller uh, decorrelation because there's overall absolute elliptical geometries over the collisions. So if it's fully overlap, the geometry will actually preserve or actually help uh, to reduce the decorrelation. So you would see, you should see the Rosinian to be slightly above the, uh, the R2 uh, of the, the Zirconium. But this is not the case. We find that this is actually the flipping is caused by the beta 3. So if I choose beta three to zero is a cornea, I actually reproduce the expanded order. But uh, the beta three actually, we introduce a beta three actually flip the order even in R2, actually, in epsilon two. On the other side, if you look at the, uh, the, the R3 ratios, you do see that a non-zero beta three in this purple actually leads to a smaller uh, decorrelations uh, in the conductive Rossini. Because the, the beta three initially have a triangle, if you pull an overlap, the overall triangle shape reduced the decorrelations at the four periods. 
So, uh, but as, as we said about this uh, initial estimate, it doesn't tell you the full story. We really need to run the hydro to get the final answer. So, once you run the hydro, you find that uh, uh, this small difference in this case is still hard to see with the current statistics for R2. But for R3, you can still see that the effects of beta 3 uh, on this R3 still remain. So, the zirconium has a smaller uh, D correlations compared to what you see, mainly coming from these uh, uh, large uh, beta 3 deformations put in the simulations. So this can be uh, the verifications of these uh, uh, survey verifications of this uh, of the deformation uh, in addition to the normal essential conditions. So that's all I have. So so we want to convince you that we have a 3D model that uh, trying to understand the production of uh, heavy particle production and the equations. And uh, the main goal is trying to understand. Uh, initial stoppings, diffusion, and transport properties of the plasma in their rich environments. In this case, we study the flow deferability decorrelations using the 3D model for gold, gold, and ISO bar. So, this gives us uh, both energy and system size dependence. And uh, with a non zero state deforming, beta 3 deformation is a conium. We find that in central collisions, the conium will have a smaller or uh, this should not small, smaller decorrelation, but not R3 compared to the recent ones. So that's all I have. Do you have do you ever calculate the ratio of V24 divided by V23 over the large No, we haven't. <laughs> I don't think we have enough of it yet. Uh, but uh, should be enough. Sure. Because uh, some time ago it's was predicted by Bill in 2006, 5 or 6, but this ratio is completely flat. And we are actually seeing that in the year C. I think it's not still. Yeah, we're also similar in RC. So, but how did you do it? You, did, you took all four particles from some small rapidity hmm? place? You took all four particles from, from small rapidity no, beds like you did? Range correlation. So that could be some decorrelation effect, but we always correlate the same way of the time. So you took like two from forward and two from backwards? One from forward, three from backwards. One and three. Because you have to pick up one point. Yeah, well, well, well we, need to, we need some detail for you guys. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you have know, four different rapidities. So <laughs> just saying we do four is a bunch of rapidity means. Yeah. <laughs> There's some big ambiguity there. Oh, we, we are using four rapidity, right? Four minus three point five to five. Yeah, no, I mean, there's four particles. So oh, yeah, there's four different rapidities that you can have in a four particle correlation. And oh, when you yeah. say, you have, to, you have to specify what you're doing. When you... <laughs> but the other thing you can look at is also the D2 versus D3. Mm -hmm. Or at least three, because they said uh, if you go to more forward rapidity, D2 or D3 is meant to turn by yeah. But I'm not sure in terms of model this is going to be 100 percent true anymore because you could, mm -hmm. because eccentricities are such a changing. Yeah, as so you know, it's become absolute to become right. bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. not that from three because we we check, yeah. we check in data so that if you look at V three versus T and D, it's not uh -huh. flat or D uh -huh. above above two, uh -huh. but then V two still has the shape. Okay. Well, that's opposite. <laughs> <laughs> In, you have a V2 drop it and epsilon 3 flat. So in our case, epsilon 2 go up. So yeah, it could be obvious. But we'll see. But the, the go up is, is kind of generic because you just go to TA. So can, can you give some uh, insight into what additional nuclear structure you can see from seeing the rapidity dependence? Um, I would say initially it's pretty hard because rapidity usually it's uh, kind of you have this uh, complicated dynamic. You need to estimate how much energy you deposit in, in another of the directions. So the structure information may or may not lost in the air, right? Um, but I would say that uh, um, one thing is you need to look at fully overlap. So these central collisions, we have everything fully overlap. We kind of imaging just a single, the shape of single nucleus. Yeah. Instead of the overlapping between two, in their case, probably you will see some. For example, if I do the same exercise for uranium versus gold, 
thought I'll see some difference in the actual results. Okay. But can you also see the fluctuations between tip to tip, body to body, and the rapidity depends? That could be, but uh, I think we need to see how to select the maps. Okay. The first thing to select the like, maybe using MPT as a handle to select the maps, and then we're going to see how to, to call it. So it could be a multiple way of diffraction, but differentiation, some of the data, and then probably see some. I just check the edit if we are right. So uh, if increase is what large I mean, I mean, V2 is increasing, yeah, and then that's interesting. Then that this model could help. <laughs> I think this calculation will be extremely useful to check again the small system calculation from, from, from start and then finish. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's the one way to work. So yeah. one way already did that. So <laughs> they have so the channel files yeah. without the interest in each other by a factor of two or three. Well, so so V3 has a factor of two difference. Yeah. So we checked. Um, so, so, so mostly when we did that uh, last November, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we can kind of using these decorrelations to explain about 50% of the difference between the two sets of data. Uh, but uh, many of the sound fine tuning if you need a bit more, but the uh, decorrelation do play an important role in these measurements between the sound physics. But it doesn't trivially really give you the entire difference. Doesn't give you the entire difference, but uh, some part of the difference does. <coughs> Yeah, that could be known. Okay. Yeah. But I guess after we have this 3D model, it's very, very important to really make sure we, we, we compare to the state of the art. Before many of the previous discussions, we compared to the system of one view, then it's compared to supersonic, which is a 3D model. Yeah. Different challenges, mm -hmm. different, different nations. Yeah, for small systems, it's quite important. Yeah. And also for key lab, I was saying, you know, energy, those those repeated tasks are quite serious. We can only do with 3D models. The 2D models are uh, hard to do. What's the difference in computational effort, 2D, 3D? So this is about a factor of 50 to 100 more expensive than the 2D one because you, you just have one more dimension. So you need to find another way to review that factor and you get the same performance. So right now it's about a factor of 50. For the initial state, does it add much or is it really No, the initial the state is like, this initial state is lightly in the past. It's like kind of. Yeah. Um, but uh, if you want to do more first principle initial state like 3D IP plasma, that is super expensive again as well. So right now, yeah, so the, um, just on the hydro part, it's about factor of 50, <laughs> more expensive. Yeah. Nice and really clever way of increasing efficiency. Yeah, so I'm working with students doing machine learning, so instead of using hydro, the machine learning on the and then, 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 but that depends on one particular observer at a time. You cannot do a full event, <laughs> that's pretty yeah. hard to do. But if you just want to focus on observer, for example, we want to do say net proton cortosis. So if you think about being able to scan how to calculate cortosis with 3D hydro, it's uh, pretty much hopeless. Mm -hmm. So, 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 one of the speed up my undergrad do is. He can, he can basically look at the initial variance uh, distribution from the cloud model and then predict the net proton repeatage based on the variance. Those are very good actions to calculate, using that model to calculate the process. But if you compare the computational effort of your 3D hydro to yeah. like astrophysics supernovas. Yeah, yeah, this is much less. <laughs> because they have much more other things in there like that. Yeah. Than these magnetic fields and all these yeah. energy stuff. That's okay. much more complicated. But they only have to calculate once. <laughs> they don't yeah, have they, to they calculate. Yeah, they just want that. They right. do want that. We need to do billion, okay. million events. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a stupid question. I also noticed in the, in the very first slide that you mentioned about the multi method. Yeah. I'm curious what exactly do you mean by that? So multi method means that you can look at hadrons, you can look at photons, you can look at jets, you all together. So they all give you different aspects of physics. Okay, somebody asked that, argue that this is not exactly like a multi-method in the astrophysics because we're not studying one instance, but we are still looking at the uh, intrinsic correlation between photons or jets with hadrons. And then we do you know, even like a statistical example average. Is there some difference, possibly? So, 
no connection to drawing the initial in the first time. Are they going to measure this uh, correlation in zircon mm -hmm. zirconia? Yeah. yeah. Are they going to measure this? Or why, why do they only have rubinium? Oh, no. So, so I didn't. They have to point it, but the, the error was too much. They haven't, I, I don't think they ended up having the, all the data. There are some preliminary. So rubinium has smaller error bars? The, the rubinium and the zirconium both are consistent with each other. Okay. I just didn't plot them. You just didn't plot it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I was actually confused when I was okay. when I was looking at the uh, uh, the reference data ranges. Oh, okay. and they were different. I thought was oh, I thought they were changing it between ruthenium and zirconium. Yeah, and they, 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 be, so those two are the same. I guess they're it's only gold is different from the yeah. others. So that, that makes more sense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, stuff can have more more precise measurements. So is that actually published or is it preliminary? I think it's a short clock measure. They have a clock measure clock. So it's preliminary or it's still preliminary. Yeah. Or the, even the go go one, I think it's still actually. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? The next step will compare with the Z numbers and snap. Thank you. Back here too. Yep. Sometimes it's slow. We're coming.